This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to chapel on this chilly and yet beautiful fall morning. We're pleased today to have with us Laura Hicks Harding, who is a 2007 graduate of King University, an English major who went on to do her master's at the University of Tennessee and has been teaching here since 2012. And she's also the director of the Writing Center. So if you do not know her, you should get to know her. (laughs) Our God, our rock in whom we trust, our shield, our salvation, and our refuge is worthy of our praise. Let us worship God. Please take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 65, 65, and let's stand and sing together. Guide me, O Thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, be thou still my 
strength and shield. Be thou still my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my angels fear subside. Death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee. seated. We often think that God is out there somewhere, distant and uncaring, but God hears our hearts. God shares our struggles. God walks with us as we try to be faithful disciples. Let us come to the one who is as close as the very breath we take in this moment, to confess the brokenness of our lives. Please join me as we pray. Eternal God, we confess that we are often indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name, but we are silent. You call us to do what is just, but we remain idle. You call us to live faithfully, but we are afraid. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow in your way that joined with those from ages past who have served you with faith, hope, and love, we may inherit the kingdom you promised in Jesus Christ. Amen. The one who searches our broken hearts has found the way to mend them and make us new people. The good news is that what God has done in Jesus Christ is for us, that we might be made whole. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thanks, Megan. Let us pray. Lord, we welcome your presence into this space and into our lives. Keep us looking out for you in all that we hear, say, do, and think right now and throughout the day. Amen. I've been thinking about sheep a lot recently. Let me explain. A couple months ago, my brother Andrew, who some of you know, packed most of his belongings into a storage unit, put the rest in a suitcase, and started a journey to the island of Iona in Scotland. Iona is remote, an island off an island off an island, as author Daniel Taylor describes it, and has become known as the center of Celtic Christianity since around the sixth century, with the abbey and grounds still housing an intentional Christian community. Shortly after Andrew left, I began looking through pictures of my own brief visit to Iona eight years ago. I flipped through the images you see here, remembering the remarkable and rugged landscape, a space filled with weather and quiet and a long history of worship. The Celtic crosses that dot the landscape around the abbey have stood there for a long time. This one for over a thousand years. As I skimmed these photos, I was invited into the reverence and contemplation that permeates <clears throat> the island from the white rocks on the shore to the old stones of the abbey. And then I ran into this picture, which broke the mood a little bit. <laughs> this appears to be a picture of my friend Hannah trying to lure an unsuspecting sheep into her arms. <laughs> the sheep clearly is not interested. And this photo reminded me of what else punctuated the landscape on Iona besides the crosses, sheep, everywhere. Sometimes standing in the middle of the road claiming the island as their own. Two weeks after this picture was taken, a year and a half after I graduated from King, I found myself in closer contact with these creatures when I began volunteering on a sheep farm in South Wales. So, uh, sidebar students, just remember when you find yourself struggling with your schoolwork, take heart. You too could one day use your college degree to shovel manure on a sheep farm. <laughs> Each day, I hiked the hill behind the old farmhouse to take in the view of the surrounding country. And each day, I passed sheep, grazing inside their fence on the hillside. Their stance was one of uncertainty and suspicion, always on the lookout for any threat, but simultaneously helpless against basically everything. <clears throat> in one moment, their wide eyes conveyed complete panic, but in the next, they communicated a complete trust, once they realized I might be there to feed them instead of eat them. <clears throat> their wool coats were heavy, weighed down from the Welsh weather, a perpetual drizzle and they bore the burdens of sticks, leaves, and mud that stuck to their undercarriage. Then one day, as I was walking by these sheep, thinking about how cute and helpless they were, it struck me. Wait a minute. These are the animals that we are so often compared to in Scripture. This comparison comes up again and again throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, God is referred to as the shepherd of Israel, and in the New Testament, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. One of the most well-known passages of scripture, which we just heard Megan read, is the 23rd Psalm, and it's all about being a sheep. Even though I had heard these passages my whole life, it wasn't until I began to live beside and work with sheep that I considered this metaphor more closely. 
Before, it was just a comforting image. A picture of Jesus surrounded by fluff and sunlight, holding a little lamb. But after my experiences on the sheep farm, I began to wonder how this comparison sounded to the Old and New Testament audiences, societies where sheep were more visible, providing wool and meat, and even acting as a religious sacrifice for the Israelites. What do we mean when we say that the Lord is our shepherd? And what does it look like to be his sheep? What can we learn from these creatures about what it means to be a follower of Christ? Looking at Psalm 23, I think the first truth we can glean about living as God's sheep is that we are called to be a people who rest. After the psalmist's declaration of who God is, the Lord is his shepherd, he immediately says that what the shepherd does is make him lie down. You make me lie down in green pastures. The verb for make in Hebrew here is actually a special verb used for making animals lie down. Initially, this may not seem like something that anyone or anything would need to be made to do. Green pastures, rest, sign me up. But anyone who has worked with sheep knows how difficult it can be to make them do anything you want, even if it's for their own good. So this verb, to make, reveals something important about who we are as humans. We are often people who don't rest well. We are restless people. And we often need to be shown what true rest should look like. In a world in which we have constant access to updates on anyone or anything at any time and are often expected to do more because of this, taking a break from our phones and to-do lists might be even harder than we initially think, especially for those of us who suffer from the dreaded fear of missing out. And yet, this psalm tells us that rest is important enough that the shepherd who knows what is best for us makes us lie down. It does not say that the Lord offers rest if we want to take it. It doesn't say he leads me to green pastures and lets me do whatever I think will make me happy there. Rather, this command to lie down is reminiscent of other commands we see in Scripture to observe a Sabbath rest, which we learn from Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees isn't primarily about setting aside a particular day to do no work. Instead, it is fuller than that. It is about how we use our time. As Eugene Peterson says, Sabbath means quit, take a break, cool it. It's a word about time, denoting our non-use of it what we usually call wasting time. Or if you heard Sarah Groves a few weeks ago, um, it's what she called her lazy time or her lazy work. The poet Mary Oliver might call it learning how to be idle and blessed. Reading on in the psalm, we get a clue as to what this rest should look like and why it's important. This isn't just any kind of rest. It's not, unfortunately, what I often tend to justify as rest eating ice cream and watching seven episodes of Parks and Recreation in a row. (laughs) I'm sure you can insert your own forms of this here. Video games, football games, shopping, the kind of rest from which you emerge, bleary-eyed and confused, unsure of where you are and what time it is. Instead, the rest of Psalm 23 is the kind of rest that restores us. In Hebrew, the implication of that is that of literally being brought back to life from the brink of death. This rest reminds us who we are and who God is. To paraphrase Abraham Heschel, Sabbath rest is important because it reminds us that the world has already been created and it will survive without our help. When we step back to rest our hands and minds from labor, we see that God is at work in the world. He is the one holding things together, and not us. Essentially, resting reminds us of the humbling truth that we are not God, that the people and places we love, and even our own lives, are ultimately not held together by our own action or will. And sometimes that's a hard truth to swallow. It gets stuck in our throats on the way down, so we would often rather busy ourselves with distractions and schedules than face that truth. But if Sabbath rest tells us the truth of who we are not, then it also reminds us who we are. We are a people whose identity and worth is found in God's love for us and not in anything that we can do or produce. This isn't always easy to believe in a culture that tells us daily, explicitly and implicitly, that we are not enough. 
that only if we work more, produce more, be more, and buy more will we have value. That we must maintain a constant stream of updates on social media for our lives to have meaning, filling the pressure to know or be what is trending, Facebooking, Snapchatting, tweeting, and Instagramming our way to relevance. And this truth is especially hard to believe right now, when all of us, faculty, staff, students alike, walk the mid-semester tightrope between fulfilling our responsibilities and maintaining our sanity, <laughs> carrying the burden of our to-do lists and worrying that one false step might send us falling. But the command to lie down tells us that God's vision of our worth is much more than what those to-do lists tell us. Listen to Barbara Brown Taylor's words on Sabbath rest. Test the premise that you are worth more than what you can produce. That even if you spent one whole day being good for nothing, you would still be precious in God's sight. And when you get anxious because you are convinced this is not so, remember that your own conviction is not required. This is a commandment. Your worth has already been established even when you are not working. Just a side note to any of my students out there, this isn't an excuse not to turn in your work or to take a nap instead of coming to class. Um, instead, this is an invitation to ask some questions about how we think about work and rest in our time. <clears throat> how can we be a community that makes space for restorative rest and honors it in others? Can we go for a walk or have coffee with a friend and leave our phones behind? Can we intentionally set aside time in our schedules for learning how to be idle and blessed instead of filling them up till they can't hold anymore? How can we help others live into the truth that we are the sheep of a shepherd who created and called us good and then rested on the seventh day? Reading on in the next few verses of the psalm, we face another important, often uncomfortable, but ultimately comforting truth about living as sheep that we are also called to be vulnerable, but at the same time, unafraid. Sheep, by their nature, are exposed and dependent, unable to defend themselves against the many threats in their environment. And the sheep in Psalm 23 are no different. This psalm tells us that being sheep is a dangerous job. It will likely include sadness and suffering, but also we shouldn't be afraid. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. While this verse declares that the Lord will be our protection, it's also a gentle reminder that we will walk through dark valleys, that being the sheep of God's pasture does not somehow exempt us from tragedy and danger. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells his first disciples that he's sending them out like sheep among wolves, indicating, perhaps, that there's something dangerous about following Christ. Here, I imagine the disciples elbowing and whispering to each other, much like we might, one of them finally speaking up. Wait a minute, Jesus, you said that one backwards, right? You mean we're supposed to be the wolves, right? Because you're giving us your power, right? While it might be easy to think this metaphor of sheep and wolves only applied to the early Christians who experienced much more danger and persecution than we 21st century Western Christians ever have, we only have to look to Jesus' teachings to see that following him can be a vulnerable job, opening us up to danger from all sides. We live in a world that tells us greatness looks more wolf-like than sheep-like, that it looks like power and security and control for those of our own pack. But Jesus tells us that greatness in his kingdom looks like sacrifice, that the greatest is the least. The first will be last, and the last will be first. While our, cult while our culture often says, blessed are the powerful, the proud, the rich, and the happy, Jesus tells us, blessed are the meek, the poor, and those who mourn. While our culture often tells us to be suspicious of our neighbors, especially if they don't look like us, Jesus tells us to love our neighbors and our enemies. All this asks of us an uncomfortable level of vulnerability. It won't take much for us to get scared when we are trying to follow these commands. 
And we don't have to look far to find circumstances that highlight our vulnerability and lead us to fear. Death in all its forms casts a long shadow over our lives. Just turn on the radio, the TV, or your Facebook feed, or even peer into your own life or the lives of those around you, and you can feel the shadow slowly creep into your day. From news of hurricanes to 100 children dead in Syria, from the angry shouts of partisan politics to word of another terrorist attack or shooting of an unarmed person, not to mention our own sadness and loneliness, the personal brokenness and tragedy of our small histories that we carry and come back to. Certainly, the shadow of death threatens to swallow all the goodness we know exists in the world and in our lives, the gifts we know God has given us but are often harder to see. Keep listening to some of these voices and you may hear them tell you exactly who and what evil looks like and why you should be afraid. These voices may say that evil looks like all the people of a different nation, a different religion, a different political party than your own. They may say in a world of wolves, your only option for survival is to become a wolf yourself. And many voices will tell you that your only option is to trust in them. Yet in the midst of the shadow of death, the voice of the psalmist says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And into the death that shadows our existence, Christ steps in again and again and says, fear not, I am with you. You may be living in a dangerous and death-shadowed world, but your ultimate residence is the house of the Lord. You don't have to live, act, or make decisions out of your fear. Instead, you can live out of Christ's dangerous and radical commands of love in a broken world. Resting as the sheep of God's pasture ultimately means we are invited to be free from fear, from the fear that we aren't enough, as well as from our fears of others and of the world. Living as sheep, we realize that we cannot protect ourselves from evil by our own efforts, and this is good news. Our safety, our help, doesn't come from our social circumstances or political parties. It doesn't come from the walls we so carefully construct between ourselves and others. It comes from Christ, who makes us rest in the knowledge that he is our shepherd, to trust that no matter where we go, he follows us with his goodness and kindness. The Lord is our shepherd and we are the sheep of his pasture. Fearful, suspicious, hesitant, and short-sighted, carrying the burden of our lives like heavy wool coats, often oblivious to the goodness Christ offers. But the good news is that the shepherd loves us anyway, leading us to the rest that restores us and reminds us who we are calling us out of the fears that so easily limit our lives. As we look toward the last half of the semester, let us live as a community of God's sheep, refusing to live in the fear the world so often offers us, resting instead in the promise that God's goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. Let's pray. Lord, our shepherd, we thank you for leading us in your loving kindness. We thank you for making us rest and freeing us from fear. Teach us how to live as your faithful and trusting sheep. Amen. Thank you, Laura. And based upon your message, we're going to switch hymns to close our service. Please take the hymn on turn to 803, 803, and let's stand and sing together.
My shepherd will supply my need. Jehovah is his name. In pastures fresh he makes me feed beside When I forsake his ways and leads me for his mercy's sake in paths of truth and grace. When I walk shades of death, your presence is my stay. One word of your supporting breath drives all my fears away. Your hand Inside of all my foes, dost still my table spread, my cup with blessing overflows, your Your provisions of my God attend me all my day. Oh, may your house be my abode and all my works be. There would I find a settled rest while others go and come. No more a stranger or a guest, but like a child. Go now, trusting in the guidance of the Good Shepherd and knowing that you are his. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. I really love